Good morning. morning. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word as we read from the book of Psalms, Psalm 78, verses 9 through 22, and then from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the word of the Lord. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the, in the region of Zoan. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob and his wrath rose against Israel. For they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. And Jesus his prayer in John 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be unto God. You may be seated. As you've heard, each week during the season of Lent, we are addressing common questions surrounding prayer. As we go through this series on prayer, we're seeking to answer some of these questions. Last week, we answered the question about God's sovereignty in prayer. Since God is sovereign, why pray? Today, we want to address the issue of knowing God. Can we know God? Is that a common question? And how do we know what God will do? See, both of these questions are answered through our experience with God. And this sermon today is entitled, Can God Spread a Table in the Desert? And in this question and this story there in in, uh, Psalm 78, we, we hear the people and you can hear it in, their, in, their, in the question that they don't really know God and they don't know what God will do. But as you read it, you get the feeling that they ought to know God. They ought to know what he will do. And why is this so? Well, because these, these are supposed to be God's people. God's people ought to know God. God's people ought to know what God will do. And this is true since from our readings, from these readings, we can see these these things. God wants us to know him. Prayer is essential to knowing God. Knowing God is eternal life. Therefore, pray. Be confident of what God will do. That's, that's where we're going. So let's think about this. Can God spread a table in the desert? So first, God wants us to know him. Look at John 17, verses 1 through 3. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, these verses tell us 
what the culmination of Christ's life has been, to make God known. Verse 1 says this, after Jesus said this. Said what? Well, the previous three chapters. And in those chapters, Jesus would tell, he was telling the disciples that God wants them to know him. Listen to what he says in John 14, verses 6 and 7, very familiar passage. Because he tells us there that to know Jesus is to know the Father. Look at what he says. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. God wants us to know him. In John 15, verse 15, Christ wants us to know his business. He wants us to know what God is doing. And he says, there no, he says there, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. See, then in John 16, verse 14 and 15, the Holy Spirit that takes in and, tell, and lets us know how generous, how magnanimous God is. Listen to what he says. He will bring, the Spirit of God, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that the Father has given, all that the Father, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. See, God wants his people to know him. He wants us to know his generosity, his goodness. He wants us to know him. What he's doing, the Son, the Spirit, the Father, the Trinity is working so that you and I can know God. And see, that's just something to get in your mind. Get this in your mind. Work it into your heart. Press it, press this truth down in your soul as you go to work, as you, as, as you parent, as wherever, whatever it is you find yourself doing, whatever situation, press this truth down into your soul. Take it into the center of the being of your being until it displaces everything else. That God wants you to know him. After Jesus spoke this, he spoke to them how much God wants them to know him, he prayed. Look at what it says. So prayer is essential to knowing God. Look at verse 1 of, of chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. See, after Jesus has spent the previous three chapters telling the disciples about knowing God, he now tells God in prayer that he's told his people how much God wants them to know him. I <laughs> see that, that, should, we, that we should let this, let this sink in because it's not coincidental that Jesus is praying this in the disciples' hearing. Have you ever prayed with people and you thought, you know, they're not really praying to God, they're praying to tell me something. You know, I mean, this is, this is what Jesus is doing. This is what he's doing here. You know, he's, praying, he's praying this in the disciples' series. He's letting them know how essential prayer is to knowing God. You see, know, knowing God is not reading about him in a book. Knowing God it's, is not even having experiences of God working and performing miracles on your behalf. That's not what it means to know God. Psalm 78 in, verse, in, in our Old Testament reading shows us this. Is what it says in verse 10 and 11. If they did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law, they forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. Uh, yeah, see, yeah, miracles aren't enough. They don't help you. They, they're not there. They don't help you to know God. Knowing God requires time spent with God, taking in his word, adoring his person, being captivated by his holiness and, and beauty, becoming intimate with God. And for this, prayer is essential. 
Paul Tripp in his book, The Journey to the Cross, it's a great little devotional. I'm using it myself for in a, during the season of Lent. And he says this about prayer. He says, prayer is one of God's sweetest gifts to us. The command to pray is itself a sweet and loving gift from a gracious and caring Heavenly Father. Prayer is where God welcomes his children to talk with him, commune with him, abide with him. It's that holy place where the deepest of worship, the deepest of needs, and the most honest of confessions all intersect with the grandeur and glory of divine love. Prayer only works when worshipers are invited into the presence of one worthy of their worship. It only works when the one being prayed to is amazingly patient, boundless in love, constantly forgiving, and sovereign in power. For prayer to be prayer, God has to be God. Without this, prayer is an act of religious futility. And isn't that, isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. You can't know God as God without prayer. And by praying himself, Jesus shows us how essential prayer is to knowing God. And therefore, the people of God ought to cultivate a habitual prayer life with the goal of knowing God. Since knowing God is eternal life. Look at verse 2 and 3. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, knowing God is exactly what eternal life is. If you were to ask the man on the street or the person on the street, say, what is eternal life? You know, well, you know, eternal is long, and so eternity never ends. And so eternal life is, is having never-ending life. Well, no, that's not what the scripture says eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing God. Knowing God is not the same as how you get eternal life. Because Jesus told us, he told us earlier how we get eternal life. In verse 2, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. So you get eternal life from Jesus as a gift to those whom God has given him. That's how you get eternal life. And this is, see, and this is the grace of God through Christ to all who believe. God wants to be known. He gives us to his son who lives and died and rose from the dead to make God known so that we might know God, which is what it means to have eternal life. I want to say that again, but I don't have time. You know, there's old, there's old gospel song by, by a Reverend Cleophas Robinson, and he said, I'm wrapped up, I'm tied up, I'm tangled up in Jesus. I'm wrapped up in his love. I'm tied up in his blood. I'm tangled up in his spirit. I feel it down in my soul. The world can't do me no harm. Hallelujah. This is what God has done. See, the knowledge of God is what gives eternal life its quality. Without him, eternal life is hell. You see, salvation always has as its end knowing God and knowing what he has done. And the scripture here says Jesus Christ has given us eternal life. Therefore, we can pray being confident of what God will do. It's back to our Old, Old Testament reading in Psalm 78. Verse 18 says, they willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they crave. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob and his wrath rose against Israel for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. You hear what's happening here? These are the people of God. These are the people of God. They're the ones that, that he had saved from the bondage of the Egyptians. They're now out in the desert. 
being followed by a pillar of fire by, by night and a, a pillar of a cloud by day, all to guide them. You know, they were, they were being, they were drinking from this rock that followed them. And Paul says that rock was Jesus Christ. They were being fed with the bread of heaven. But that wasn't enough. Their cravings didn't change. Why is that? Well, the Bible says here that they did not believe in God nor trust in his deliverance. See, the desert, the desert was more real. Their cravings were more real to them than the salvation that the Lord had provided. You know what happens in the desert? See, the desert reveals what it is you really love. So be careful, brothers and sisters, be careful that your present desert and the cravings that arise, that are arising out of your heart, isn't diminishing your confidence in trusting God's salvation. Because we're traveling, we're traveling through the desert of this broken world, aren't we? All right, only a few of you know that. All right, so, so we're traveling through a desert of isolation and loneliness that's exacerbated by the pandemic. We're traveling through a desert of a lack of unity between the ethnicities and between classes. We're traveling through a desert of political gamesmanship that would leverage the suffering of the community to maintain power. We're traveling through a desert of conflicting individual cravings that clouds our ability to know God. We're traveling through a desert of disappointing leaders. And in these deserts, we're tempted, we're tempted to test God. We're tempted not to trust in his deliverance by asking that very question, can God spread a table in the desert? God has spread a table. He has spread a table for us in these deserts and it's here in the table of our Lord. It was here in, in the, at the Lord's table, our cravings are tamed as we trust in the Lord's salvation. You see, and for, so for it's here, it's here in the Lord's Supper, Jesus brings to us the bread of heaven. He brings to us the cup of salvation for our hungry and thirsting souls. See, during the Lord's Supper, don't we pray? We pray remembering the Lord's deliverance that brought us to God while we pray knowing and looking forward to Christ's return. See, the table of our Lord reminds us that God is with us in the desert. Hallelujah. Wasn't it in the desert when Jesus said to us, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was showing us what is necessary for us in the desert. See, the table of our Lord reminds us that God with us in the desert, he makes the desert to bloom. Hallelujah. So it's here in the Lord's table. The thing we need most, redeeming grace, is brought to us through Christ's death for our sins, his burial, his resurrection, the promise and hope of his coming. Here, it is all here in the table of our Lord. It's redeeming grace. So here's the question. Since God wants us to know him, and since prayer is essential to knowing God, since knowing God is eternal life, and God has spread a table in the desert, why not spend your days pursuing the knowledge of God, pursuing knowing God? See, so Lent is 40 days, it's so, so take this time to deepen 
your knowledge of God through prayer. And you can pray, you can pray in solitude. You, yeah, your prayer can be, you can pray in your closet, when, and, and, but, but pray with other believers too. Do it with other believers. So during the Sunday school hour and Sunday evening, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, early Friday morning, Friday, late Friday morning as well, all are opportunities, opportunities to pray with, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. One hour, one hour a week is what, is what's be, you're, what you're being asked, is what you're being called to. One hour a week until Easter. And let it transform you. Let it transform you. Paul Tripp, again, he reminds us just how, how prayer does this. He says this, he says, the heart of prayer is worshipful submission to him, God, which produces gratitude, humility, vision, and willingness in us. So prayer is a fight. Prayer takes work. Prayer calls us to go to places we don't often go and give our hearts to do what we do too infrequently. Brothers and sisters, yes, we pray without ceasing, the scripture calls us to. But we do it too infrequently. May the Lord help us as we pray. Because everything is prepared for us. God has spread a table in the desert. And as we come to the Lord's table, 